What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture. It's a place of history. It's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences. And that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources, the Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. 
so many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment, what I saw these young African Americans doing, was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up, and to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes, and I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center. Good morning. I want to be that person, but I feel like you could do better than that. I said, good morning. Good morning. Right, y'all are young. Y'all could give me the energy. Good morning. Welcome to the Schomburg Center, folks. This is our 11th annual Black Comic Book Festival. My name is Katie Atu Tubman. I'm the Schomburg Center's Education Manager of Programs and the Executive Producer of the Black Comic Book Festival. And it's my privilege to welcome you to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Over the course of nearly 100 years, the Schomburg Center's librarians, curators, educators, and other professional staff have worked tirelessly to provide robust and free public access to more than 11 million items that document black life and promote the study of black history and culture. History is not only housed here, it's made here. And this festival is historic. As I mentioned, this is our 11th year. This festival is one of New York City's most exciting events for comic book creators, fans, consumers from all across the country. I'd like to thank the Schomburg and NYPL for sustaining this program throughout the years. Programs like this one you're attending today exist because of our commitment to imagination, representation, and freedom. We hope you continue to visit the Schomburg Center and access our collections, public programs, and exhibitions. Now, I know there's a lot of young folks in the, in the audience, and I'm curious to know, let's do it by like, grade level-ish. How many of you are in preschool or kindergarten? All right, tough crowd, tough crowd. I know you probably can't raise your hand. Okay, there we go, we got one, okay. How many of you are in elementary school 
So first grade, second grade, make some noise for yourselves. Come on, elementary school. Y'all roll deep. Any of you in middle school? Any middle schoolers? We got some middle schools over here. And I guess if I say high schools, it's too early for y'all. Any high school students? It's really early for you guys. Thank you for making it. All right, and so some quick housekeeping before we get started. We have our viewers online. We want you to engage with us. So whether you're on YouTube or our shamcom.org site, please engage in the comments and, and talk and be in community with each other. For the folks in the auditorium, we have a couple of two programs that are back to back. We ask you to remain seated for both programs, after which our exhibitor marketplace will open up after 12 p.m. and you'll be able to leave through that exit and head straight to see all of our wonderful creative writers, content creators, all of that and above out there. Um, if you have any, if you're taking photos, we ask that you not take any photos inside the auditorium. We have a great, some photographers here who are going to be taking photographs. Everything will be recorded for you to see later on. You'll also have access to those photographs as well. Uh, lastly, again, please use the exit on your left to leave the auditorium. We'll be hosting book signings with authors in our Latimer Gallery after each and every program today. All right? So our first program is called Generation Z, The Future of Comics. That's going to be hosted by our, our moderator, uh, A.K. Lovelace, and some uh, students from Harlem School of the Arts. So please, yeah, give it up for them. Come on. <laughs> After that program, we have a very exclusive and special screenings from the Little Apple Universe. I'm telling you, this is awesome, amazing, amazing work representing comics animation with black youth. So you really want to stay seated for that one. Um, so just be prepared for that to happen after that panel conversation. All right, so AK Lovelace, please welcome AK and the Harlem students, our Harlem art students to the stage. Come on, y'all. Good morning. Um, my name is A.K. Lovelace. I'm the chair of the Media and Design Department at Harlem School of the Arts, not far from here. Uh, a few years ago, we started a comic book production program, um, which over time has become very large. And these are three students from that program. Would you like to introduce yourselves, please? Um, I'm Marley Alvarez. I'm 16 years old, and I live in East Harlem. Uh, I'm Maximo de Jesus, born and raised in Dykeman and in Inwood. Um, I'm Kyan. My name's Kyan Ban. I'm 16 years old, and I live in Harlem. So uh, the name of this panel is uh, Generation Z, the future of comics, the reason that we chose that name is because uh, once upon a time there was an X-Men comic book called Generation X and it was obviously a comic of its time. Uh, you guys are all Generation Z, they're Generation Z and the future belongs to the youth. So we thought, we thought that that was an appropriate uh, way to go. So to get ourselves started, I'm going to start asking you guys some questions. And I hope you can be a little candid for our audience here. Um, so to start off, when was your earliest memory of being introduced to comic books? Uh, so I was drawing my whole life. And as an artist, as someone who's been interested in those things, that have media for my entire life, I've known and read comic books forever now. So my dad would talk to me about Marvel, and that's when I first got into it. Um, my father was also very interested in comic books. He always had these vintage big Spider-Man compendiums and Superman, as well as the Avengers. And my cousins also were big comic book fans. So they all kind of introduced me to the arts my parents are also very big fans of the arts and supporting artists, so they've always supported me during my journey. So I started also drawing from a very young age. 
Um, yeah, it's a similar situation with me. Like, my dad was, like, super into comic books, so we had, like, a little library at home, and he had, like, a bunch of comics sitting there, so I used to just, like, read through it and stuff. Like, I remember artists like Jim Lee were in there, who was a big inspiration for me. I might be going forward, but yeah, that was my... Yeah. So, for all three of you, your introduction was American comics. Now, when... I was coming up at your age, um, the landscape was really American comic dominated. Uh, you know, unless you really had some sort of uh, access to Chinatown or maybe some sort of bookstores, you really didn't have much of an understanding of a world of comic books outside of Marvel, DC, or Dark Horse, or even Image. So that's not the case for you guys. Y'all grew up in a much, much changed landscape. So I know you started with American comics, but all three of you from a stylistic standpoint clearly had other influences. So you started with American comics. When did, it, when did that first introduction to non-American comics kind of come into the game? Okay, so when I was in middle school, I was introduced to anime because that's when everybody was talking about all the anime they liked, like My Hero Academia, Dragon Ball, specifically Dragon Ball. Like, Dragon Ball was a bit earlier. We would all, like, talk, we would all power scale all the characters and talk about, like, who would win against who, like, Goku and Vegeta, who's really better, right? Ever since then, it's been, like, anime, manga, webtoons, and it expanded greatly ever since then. Like, the amount of, the types of comics I read, like manhwa, they're manhwa, manga, and obviously American comics, like, come on, Marvel. Yeah. Marvel's still on top. Yeah. Forever, always been. Um, for me, I was not introduced to anime first, but when I was trying to learn how to draw, I would usually go to uh, art stores like Michael's and there would be these how to draw anime style books. And <laughs> if you're familiar with them, you know that as you grow as an artist, you start to see that maybe some aspects of those books aren't necessarily very good to learn from, but I really loved them because it was like a style that I really admired and get my hands on and learn from. So I made my parents buy so many of those books. And through getting introduced to those books and authors, I eventually started to look at more manga I wasn't allowed to watch that much TV, but I usually got like mangas like Naruto and Soul Eater from the library, and eventually I started to like them a bit more. My dad's also a big anime fan. Like he bought di uh, DVDs from Chinatown to watch Evangelion for Netflix and all that stuff. So he supported me and my siblings in our anime journey, I would say. Yeah, I was introduced to um, anime in like elementary school and the how to draw anime books in elementary school as well, probably fourth grade. Um, yeah, I remember like surfing through Netflix and then I saw Naruto and I think I was like really cool. I saw like ninjas and like this poofing and shurikens and stuff. Like so it was really cool. So like got really into it. Then me and my friends we used to make like characters of like how, what powers we had, what we could do, like the Jinjerky, if you know what that is. Um, but yeah, I was like really, really into it. And like the how to draw anime books like really like propelled me to do even more. Cool. So uh, another key aspect of uh, this process is um, the presence of people that look like us in comics. Um, when I was coming up, that really wasn't a, a thing, per se. We would have characters here and there, but certainly on a creator level, it just wasn't, we didn't have that kind of a footprint. And there is definitely a thing from my generation in terms of uh, our natural inclinations when we got into comics for the kinds of things that we would draw. And there's a direct line from not seeing ourselves and how we approach doing comics. 
was there a point for you guys where it kind of started to trickle in for you that, wow, I don't see a lot of characters that look like me in any of my favorite comic books, or I, I'm starting to learn about comic book creators, but all the comic book creators are Japanese, or they're white, or there are a lot of different things maybe, but they're not, you know what I'm saying? Does that like a moment that you guys kind of encountered? Uh, yeah, like for a lot of the things I watched, well, Marvel aside, because that's more American, there are a lot more people of color in Marvel comics than there are in anime, manga, and stuff like that. That's an amazing point. Yeah, because I would always watch anime and read manga. It like, I would draw in that sort of style, you know, and it took a while of learning and getting, developing new skills, looking at new things, new people, new references to take in like absorb how to draw different types of people, especially people in my own color. Like it's, it's weird like saying different types of people when the different type of person is me. <laughs> so yeah, like for the first like, oh my God, countless hours of drawing, I didn't, I had no clue how to draw black people. And then it was, you know, I learned, I saw lots more black people in comics and, and manga especially, even though like I can count on one hand how many black people I know from manga and anime. That, yeah, because it's very, it's not American. There's not so much African, African-American influence in manga, but, but, hey, those, yeah, now we're doing much better. I can draw black people better than I could draw anything else. Um, for me, it was pretty much the same, like, because I read so much material that didn't have any black people in it, I didn't draw them myself. Something else interesting is that I was also a big fan of graphic novels, which became really popular, I think, when I was like a middle schooler, which are like, they're just comic books, but longer and a little bit more, people think they're better, I guess, because they're more like books. But those also did, weren't very diverse, something I noticed as I got older. So I didn't end up drawing very diverse people. It was my mom who pointed it out. And I think over time- So your mom, your mom, pointed out that you're doing all this comic book drawing and you're not drawing yourself. Yeah, she was like, you're not drawing any black people. And then she would, she would watch anime. She'd be like, why does that guy have fish lips? Because some black anime characters look very interesting. Or she'd be like, this show has no black people in it. Why are they all white? And I'd be like, well, they're not all white, you know, because she didn't really understand everything. But I guess after a while, I started to sort of see that, like I had to start learning to draw more diverse things. Just because it's one of the ways you can become a better artist, you can't just draw the same thing all the time. You need to learn how to draw different kinds of people even if you're only using one style. And I think now, while I haven't really checked out a lot of modern comic books, I think it is more diverse. But what's really been more diverse is like the amount of artists who are like cartoonists or illustration illustrators, and they'll draw black people and they'll be black illustrators, and then they'll have their own unique styles. And by looking at those, it's very inspiring and you can learn how to improve your style with drawing more diverse casts. So you have already noticed, even in this relatively brief amount of time, that the, the, the trickle of uh, black and brown influence in comics is, has increased, but for now, it's mostly increased from the creator side of it, from what you've observed. Yeah, I feel like they're like drawing Afrocentric features in your characters has had to become a skill that I've had to develop simply because all the things that I've, all the media I've been intaking, like prior to that, hasn't really shown that. It's there's it wasn't represented for a long time, but now it is. So we're doing good. Um, yeah, I kind of noticed that um, realization when I was just like looking at anime and I was drawing and I was just like, like there, there's a lot of white people and like <laughs> Asian people. And I, I like, I didn't take it as like, oh my gosh, this is like the problem. And I was just like, oh, okay. And then I kept kind of going on with it. But like even like some of the black characters in anime, they'll kind of just be like, like they'll look the same as like the white dude, but just with black skin. And it's just like strange. Because, like, black people have facial features which are different than others. We have, like, thicker lips, bigger noses. So, ooh, my fault. So, um, yeah, I just thought of that as, like, 
really strange. Like, I didn't really take it, like, racist. I was just, like, very, like, what? Like, I just thought it didn't make sense. Mm. So you literally, that's actually really interesting. So you didn't have, so to go back to what, when I started this particular point of discussion, I didn't think of it as being unusual per se, because the thing was, it, w it was such a whitewashed environment. Exactly, it's been like so normalized. But you did not have that interpretation when you came to that moment. It was yeah. different for you. Yeah, it was different. Like I didn't see it as offensive. I was just like, that's happening. I didn't like, it's a problem just to like say and let it keep going. But I was just like, it's very strange that this is happening. Yeah. So you had like, it was, that's so, so for my generation, it was normalized. But for you guys, it, you had already, I don't know, I guess, uh, I guess at a cultural level, you guys had already progressed to the point where you didn't look at it as normal. It yeah. wasn't normal for you. It was naturally unnormal to you that we weren't. Expressed, yeah. Right, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. So when, so I, I know that for myself, there was definitely a moment where I started to make conscientious decisions when I was drawing comics to start making characters that looked like me. Um, it wasn't uh, the predominant factor per se, but it was definitely something that I started to have a, a, an active mindset about. Was that something that you guys are kind of started to contend with now where you're actively sit down to craft a new story and you kind of make a decision like, I'm this character is going to be black. Like my main character, you know, is that something that you do? Yeah. Is it something? And do you feel, is there kind of like a, a little bit of a, a funny moment that happens when you do that where you're like, well, that's kind of messed up. <laughs> like, <it's> like <laughs> yeah. I had to, I had to like, I had to make the conscious choice to make, <laughs> to make one of my favorite characters black. And it struck like after I, after I, realize that the decision was conscious and that I don't normally draw like, ap like characters with Afrocentric features. That's when I kind of realized, you know, that's when it occurred to me. Maybe I should, maybe I should put more, like diversify my cast more, draw more black characters. And um, yeah, like I, I remember when I was creating my story and I, after I created the plot and everything, cause plot comes first, then I, had character designs and I was working on these um, character profile sheets that you normally do so that you know how a character will look typically when you animate it or when you draw it, right? For, for reference, when you're drawing the same character 20 times. Yeah, so to, to help Max out a little bit here, also Max talking to the mic, man. Hmm? Talking to the mic. Talk to the mic? Yeah. Um, oh, my bad. When, <laughs> when you guys are, are when anybody makes a comic book, one of the things that you don't really think about is the fact that when you draw a comic book, you're going to be drawing a character many, 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 many times in a row. And consistency is something that's really important for your reader. Your reader needs to be able to identify your character and be able to know that that's the same character from page to page. So when these guys are doing their character designs, one of the things that's really important for them is being able to lock down the features of their characters. You have to basically learn how to draw your own character, which sounds weird, but it's one thing to draw something and make it look good once. It's another thing to draw something and make it look good dozens of times and make it look the same. So that's what Max was just describing now, just the process of yeah. creating a character and literally learning how his character looks so he can reproduce that character from panel to panel and page to page. I remember what he said, what Kyan said earlier about the characters that are black in anime typically looking the exact same as everyone else but with darker skin. What, yeah, moving back onto what AK said, you have to really learn how to draw the, Af the, the Afrocentric features on your characters no matter what angle. Like, it, it, those Afrocentric features are different. They are what make the character look black without you having to color it in, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I'd say the conscious decision was a bit more unconscious. 
And I think one of the reasons for that is because like, when I draw my characters, I take a lot of inspiration from the people around me and the experiences that I've had. When I was a kid, I grew up in Massachusetts and I grew up in a little suburb, so it was not very diverse. For me, when I saw comics with only a couple black characters, that wasn't weird to me because like, it wasn't weird for there to be one black kid in a class of white kids, like that was me. So I was like, oh, whatever, it's normal. So I didn't see it as something unusual. But when I came to the city, which I'm so jealous of all of you getting to live here because I wish I'd grown up here, it's so much more fun. When I came here, I was able to be introduced to all sorts of different people and that kind of made my worldview expand and the characters I created also changed because I wasn't just seeing white people, I was meeting black people, Latino people, Asian people and I made tons of friends and all of my friends, all people I meet who I care about, I want to see them in my work because they're such a big influence on me in my life. So for me, <laughs> thank you. It was a very unconscious decision. It just kind of changed over time, I would say. Cool. Um, so let's talk, uh, let's talk some inside baseball here. All three of you are, by the way, I know I don't have an example to show, unfortunately, but these three are exceptionally great young artists. These guys are doing pro-level work, and they're not out of high school. Um, they literally have dozens of, actual dozens of comic book pages under their belt. Um, at HSA, we literally make comics. Um, we are gonna start printing them soon, so we've already dipped our toe in that water and it was nice. So uh, these guys are, legitimately um, doing the thing, as it were. Uh, when you think about the, when you sit down to, to, to make a story um, and you think about where you wanna take that piece of work in this kind of like modern space that we're talking about, like, what do you think? Do you think, oh, you know what, I, I, I could go digital with this, or, you know, I should start going to conventions. Like, when you go to conventions and stuff, have you guys gone to any comic book conventions? I know that you have. Oh, you guys gotta start going to comic book conventions, man, that's terrible. Um, like, but do you think about what your work looks like in a business space? Um, typically when I'm drawing a comic book, I really overthink a lot, like layouts and everything. I try and make it look like as cool and explicable as possible without the words so that, you know, the story could be somewhat successful if I ever released it, you know? So say I went to a comic book com convention, the first thing I would do is look at everyone else's, see what they all have going on, all have simul similar, so that I could like put that into my work. So um, how, many, how many double page spreads, right? Or the pacing, or what shape should a lot of the layouts be so it doesn't look too plain, too... Um, boring, right? Because you don't want your comic book to look boring. You usually look at all the good stuff, all the coolest comic books so that you know what's interesting to look at so that people will gravitate towards your work. So your work is cooler than everyone else's so that your work is actually special, you know? Um, when I make my artwork, I want to make it different because I think there are like a lot of people who can do what I do and draw what I draw. I just want to see how I can make it different and like change it up a bit. Because when I look at um, reference, when I make my comic book pages, I look at like other artists like Oliver Coipel. Ooh, my fave. Jim Lee, yeah, he's just really good. Um, and I like, look at how they place the panels, look at how they design it, because when you're creating a comic book panel or like page, it's like creating almost an art piece and it has to be arranged in a certain way where the viewer can follow it and not get confused too easily. 
and I want to make it as simple as it is complex. So I like human anatomy. I love drawing people. So how can I like make this page have like a hundred bodies and like still flow within through like the page? That's how I look at it. Um, you just brought up one of my favorite comic artists, Olivier Coipel. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Olivier Coipel is a world-renowned comic artist, and he is black, and he is top of the game. So again, just in terms of something that Marley spoke about earlier, uh, this changeover where more creators are coming to the forefront that look like us, one of the best comic book artists out there now and has been one of the best for many years now is a black man. So that's something to, to hang your hat on. Um, Marlon? Um, I do think about how I would make my work different than others. I like to think about what people think if they ever read my work. It's never been published, so I'm, I want to see what happened if it was. But sometimes I imagine like getting really popular or if I wouldn't be popular and to see what I could do better if more people had their eyes on it. So I definitely do think about it. When I'm working on my comics, I like to do really fun layouts and also focus a lot on doing black and white. And I know I, need, I have skills I need to work on, like making my art clearer, but I'm always really excited to improve and someday be professional. So we, kind of touched on a couple of things. One of the things that we, it's come up, but we haven't really focused on is um, influence. And I know Kai in, in particular, is a, you're a real student of the game. Um, at any number of moments, I have come across Kai in uh, basically, well, to use a hip hop term, digging in the crates. Um, online, looking up artists that I know, but for him to know that artist um, was very impressive. I, like this guy literally shoot me, he literally shot me a text the other day um, <laughs> of uh, Jim Lee's Batman when Jim Lee did uh, Black and White years ago. He's like, oh, is this the one that you were talking about? I was like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, all right, cool. And he just goes, goes back to what I know he's doing, so. but. When it comes to influences and style, style cues, like who are some of the people that, or some of the errors that you like to go to? Um, so I am horrible at remembering names. <laughs> but if you want my stylistic choice, I would say Ve the author of Vagabond, well, I'm going to list a lot of manga here. Vagabond, Tokyo Ghoul. Tokyo Ghoul has some amazing art. I love reading their work. I love reading the work. It has amazing pacing, too. So that's what I look at for pacing. I look at Vagabond for my art because it has amazing art. And the inking skills of that artist, if, I, if only I could remember the name, are amazing. So... I look to different artists for different things, depending on what they're best at, because each person has their own sets of strengths and weaknesses. So I'm good at drawing, but I can't write a story. I mean, I wrote my story, and I think I wrote it pretty well, but people have their strengths and weaknesses. So I'll look at different artists for different things. I'll read different stories to see, what can I take from this? Okay. Um. A big inspiration and influence for me was Jim Lee. I keep mentoring his name, like mentioning his name because like he's such a big influence for me. Like, cause when I used to draw, I used to like make a hundred, a hundred, a hundred layouts. I used to be like scratching up the paper, ripping the paper because I was like drawing on it so much. And I was like, all, like always making these like indecisive, like, um, what is it? Pencil strokes. And then like, I was just like, like I always saw this finalized art, this all, all this like clean art, and I always like thought I could never look, like my art could never look like that until I saw him like, he has a YouTube channel and he was like drawing and I saw he was doing the same thing as me. And I was like, oh, so I'm not the only person who like does a hundred layouts of their character and then draws it. So like it was really like a 
hurrah moment for me because like I realized that I wasn't the only person out there who was doing that. So um, even his like anatomy skills, his like X-Men run, that was like a really, really cool comic for me. Like my dad had those, um, what is it, comics in his library. I used to look at the X-Men one a lot. Um, yeah. Well, we would like to thank you for coming here and listening to us. And I'd like to give you a round of applause to yourself for taking interest in this. Um, once again, we are Harm School of the Arts. I would like to thank my students, Marley, Max, and Kyan. And please, please, please look out for these people. Come to HSA, come check us out. We're doing big things. And these guys are definitely going places. Thank you very much for having us.